arriving at Dufferin, Dufferin Station. Hey guys, it's Saturday, December 19th. The time is 11.13 p.m. and the temperature outside is 2 degrees Celsius. I'm here at Dufferin Station and the plan for this one is to head on up to Bloor Street West and from there I'll walk east along Bloor Street. for a walk that should span a little over four kilometers. And I'll end up at Bloor Young Station. There's a look north up Dufferin Street. I don't know why I had to think about that for a second. And this here would be the intersection of Dufferin and Bloor. So I'll be turning left here, which is walking east. This area is known as Bloor Court Village and it spans from Dufferin Station over to about where Christie Park or Christie Pitts Park is to the east. And then I'll be passing through Koreatown and then the Annex and then the Yorkville neighborhood. And just on the other side of the street is the Bloor Gladstone Library. That building dates back to 1913. It sits on the corner of Gladstone Avenue and Bloor Street West. You can take Gladstone Avenue South all the way down to Queen Street West, where you'll find the Gladstone Hotel. However, it does get interrupted by Dufferin Grove Park. So you could walk it, but if you're driving that route, you would need to take a detour. And you probably couldn't guess it by all the people out in the streets, but the city is still under what the province is calling a lockdown.
We'll just let this person turn. And on Monday, which is tomorrow, they have announced that there will be more announcements regarding further restrictions. What those entail is anybody's guess, but there's really not much more they can do in terms of shutting things down. A lot of people are speculating that all public schools will be closed and all the students will have to learn from home. Most retailers are already closed and only able to offer curbside pickup. That is, unless, of course, you're a large big box retailer. For some reason, they're allowed to fully open. Or retail stores that do sell essential goods, which is mostly food items. And of course, one of the big ones is restaurants are limited to takeout only. So we'll have to see what these announcements are tomorrow. Or rather, it's Saturday, but this video will be uploaded on Sunday, so the announcements will come a day after it's uploaded. And here is the Paradise Theater. That originally opened back in 1937. It closed in 2006, but was given heritage status in 2007, which prevented the building from being fully redeveloped. It was renovated and reopened in 2019. And it's currently featuring a wine shop on the main floor. And I think that owner has plans to put in a restaurant right next door to it. And although this area is called Bloor Court Village, most people would just simply say it's the Bloor and Ossington area, or Bloor and Dufferin, where I started. Yeah, something smells garlicky and quite good. This here is Dover Court Road. There's a new cannabis shop moving into that location.
This stretch of Blur Street is one of the most vibrant and interesting walks. At least in my opinion, it's one of my favorite ones. I often find myself live streaming along this stretch. There's Long and McQuaid, one of the most well-known music instrument retailers in the city. It looks like that cafe location has quite the lineup. That would be another cannabis shop. They are only allowed to operate on a curbside pickup basis. Yet the provincially run liquor store is open for in-store shopping. Try to make heads or tails of that one. I know I've brought that up in the past, but there's a lot of things going on right now that don't make a whole lot of sense to me. Although it's certainly encouraging to see so many people out supporting local businesses. We definitely need to do a lot more of that. And this here is the intersection of Bloor and Ossington. So just to the north here would be Ossington Station, so that would be Subway station number two in this walk. I just quickly added up eight subway stations in my head when I made that comment. Maybe I'll fact check myself on the way. There's the 63 Ossington bus pulling out. That'll be heading down to Liberty Village. Bad Dog Comedy Theater. Unfortunately, there's a for lease sign in the window. There's another cannabis shop popping in. Speaking of which, I'll probably do another stream tomorrow night from my home where I consume some locally sourced edible products. I do those on my other channel. There will be a link to that one in the description if you're interested in checking that out. And we're walking by a lot of outdoor patio setups that are no longer able to be utilized. There's someone lining up at a gluten-free bake shop.
There's a place over there called Vegan Donuts. I've never noticed that before. I've probably walked by it a few dozen times. You kind of have to wonder how these landlords are going to fill these spaces up with retail tenants who might not even be able to operate until the spring or even summer next year. Remember this place, Madras Masala, used to be a 7-Eleven convenience store a long time ago. There's a look at Christie Pitts. I used to live just on the other side of the park, just on the north on a street called Pendrith. I quite enjoyed living in this neighborhood, and I would not hesitate to come back if the need to move from where I currently am ever came to be. There's a large baseball field in there where the semi-professional Toronto Maple Leafs of the Inter-County League play. And this was once home to the unfortunate Christy Pitts riots. I've talked about that incident in a prior video. That's certainly a black eye on the city of Toronto's history. You can kind of see the baseball field off in the distance there. And that's a pretty good tobogganing hill as well. So this would be Christie Street on the north side and Grace Street on the south side and would signify the entrance to Koreatown. Ironically, it was when I lived in this area, the next place I lived after I moved was to Seoul in South Korea. This tiger lights up at night. Kind of a neat feature. And there's Christie Station. So that would be subway station number three so far. And that Baskin Robbins has been there for as long as I can remember. There's a lesson in how not to jaywalk. So hot dog, that looks neat. And that would be the Poop Cafe, which is a dessert cafe that's really more of a novelty. It's not particularly good, and it's rather overpriced. 
So it's easy to see why they would certainly be struggling in the current climate. And there is Clinton's. That's a local institution that closed up earlier in the summer and it was purchased and saved. However, apparently the new owner had let all the existing staff go and replace them. And I haven't had a chance to go back and check it out since it's reopened. And it might be quite some time before I can do that, unfortunately. And there's Sundabu Dolsat Bop, otherwise known as the Green Sign Restaurant. That's one of the most well-known restaurants in Koreatown. They also have another location up in North York in Willowdale. That's another area that has a lot of Korean restaurants. But I think this area, hands down, is the better of the two, if that's what you're into. That used to be a movie theater. And it later turned into a different kind of movie theater. Not the kind you'd send your kids to. And there's PAT. That used to be my local supermarket when I lived around here. interesting to see how everyone is sort of hyper aware of their surroundings and their distance from others. That's certainly a big difference from what you would have seen a year ago. And I've heard it said that Koreatown looks a lot like what big Korean cities actually would have looked like in the 70s and earlier part of the 80s. When I went to Seoul, it was around 2007. And at that time, it was just a sea of neon lights and very modern looking storefronts. So I could definitely see how this has more of an older world feel to it. And I went back to Korea last year. I posted some videos on this channel around the Gangnam area where I used to live and a few other videos. So it was interesting to see how Korea had changed. When it comes to development and the speed at which things change there, it's certainly much quicker moving than what we have here. They'll announce a subway line, shovels will go in the ground, they'll do their tunneling with minimal distraction at street level. And then it seems as if just a few years later, the subway line opens up. It's amazing how quickly they get stuff done. And even retail stores, you'll notice, will shut down and almost overnight an entirely new store will appear completely finished in its place. And there is a look down Palmerston Avenue, or rather Palmerston Boulevard. That particular section is one of the nicest residential streets in the city. It's got those traditional looking lampposts.
Palmerston Avenue is on the north side of Bloor. And it's Boulevard to the south. That guy's got a hardcore lens setup. And I've mentioned it before, but it's hard not to. That's my favorite restaurant in Koreatown. And one of my favorite in all of Toronto, actually. Han Cook, it's a duck albi restaurant. They serve cheese duck albi. Maybe I'll see if they deliver. I don't. I could order to Young and Eglinton from there. But maybe I'll have that from another Korean restaurant. That's certainly a type of food you'd rather get the in-restaurant experience of eating, but we don't really have that choice right now. There's Mervish Village, the former home of Honest Ed's, which was an iconic and very large discount. Pretty much multi-purpose retailer. I don't know how you'd classify it. Some people might just call it a giant dollar store. And the redevelopment going in will be a mix of rental apartment buildings and commercial retail and public spaces. I think there will be five towers in total and 32 of what they're calling micro buildings. We are experiencing almost a trend of professionally managed rental buildings growing up in the city. For the longest time, the rental building stock was quite old and not particularly interesting design-wise. They're mostly just giant brutalist looking slabs. But there's been a resurgence in more modern looking rental buildings growing up. And this is Bathurst Street. So just to the north here, you'll find Bathurst Station where normally you can jump on a streetcar. There's actually a streetcar entering the loop there, but it says not in service on it. There's construction to the south of Bathurst, right around the uh, Gardner Expressway. So there are running buses along Bathurst instead of streetcars. So that's subway stop number four. Now we're in the Annex neighborhood, as signified by that street pole there. And earlier I had walked by the Paradise Theater, and this is the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema. It originally opened back in 1941. And it had replaced the theater that came before it. It was built in 1913. It had closed, I think, in 2010. Sorry, that guy had <laughs> distracted me. There's Popper's Pub, owned by the same people who run the Madison Pub on Madison Avenue. So that theater had closed in 2010, but eventually it reopened and Rogers made a fairly generous donation to keep it alive, which also entailed renaming it the Ted Rogers Hot Dog Cinema. And I remember going to an Asian Toronto Film Festival at some time back in the 1990s, and that was my first time ever going to that theater. I saw a movie called The Bodyguard from Beijing.
There's Sushi Angor in their newer location. And maybe there's some kind of video game release going on. There's people lined up at EB Games, which is the Canadian version of GameStop. And there's the Victory Cafe. There used to be a bar by that name in Mervish Village that closed down as part of that redevelopment of Honest Ed's. And it's reopened as a pizza restaurant, which is kind of strange. It doesn't really have the atmosphere at all of the old place, but I guess I wanted to keep the name alive. And I've seen a few of these monkey sushis around the city. That must be a newer chain. There's where the Brunswick House used to be, but of course it is now a Rexall. What else? I think I'll just stay on the north side of Blue Street for this walk. Let's look south down Brunswick Avenue. And there is B&B Books. It's a large used book retailer. It was kind of handy when I was in university. I found a few things that I was assigned to read in there. Chicken sandwiches seem to be all the rage these days, ever since Popeye set the world afire with their newest offering. It seems as if, as if uh, everyone else is promoting their offerings. There's the Walmer Road entrance to Spadina Station. So that would be Subway Station number five on this walk. You can see they peeled the 24-hour sign off the Metro supermarket. That looks like another rental dwelling will be going in here. That will be 24 stories. And there's where Greg's ice cream used to be. They were originally located across from the ROM, 
which is just up ahead here. And I have no idea if they had relocated or closed up for good. So this is Spadina Road on the north side of Bloor, and on the south, you'll find Spadina Avenue. You can take that down through Chinatown all the way to the lake. And just to the north here is the Spadina entrance to the Spadina Station, where you can access both the Line 1 and Line 2 subway trains. And you can also access both lines from the next stop. I'll be passing by St. George, which is a little more convenient to, or rather a lot more convenient to transfer from one line to the other as they're stacked directly on top of each other at St. George. Whereas quite a walk to get from one to the other at Spadina. So a lot of the surrounding streetscapes in this part of Bloor are dominated by the University of Toronto. Here's Madison Avenue. This building on the left used to be, probably still is, a student residence. I know a few people that stayed in there way back in the 90s. This building's part of the University of Toronto. Its exact function is slipping my mind right now. And these apartment buildings here were originally part of the university. They're sort of home to an interesting learning experiment. I think they're called the Roach Apartments. What I most associate them with is when I was looking for a place in this area, there's a few units in there that were relatively affordable given the location. And further research revealed that they were infested with bed bugs. The whole building was apparently, but that was back in the mid 2000s. So hopefully that problem's since been rectified. We don't really hear too much of bed bugs these days. Maybe we've just got better techniques in terms of how to handle them. I don't really know. But it used to be a rather contentious issue. At least in the 2000s, if I can remember correctly. There's a lot of finger pointing between landlords and tenants as to who should do what. And there's the Bata Shoe Museum. I've been, I've been there exactly twice, I think. Twice that I can remember. And this here would be St. George Street. So just to the north here, you'll find St. George Station. So that will be subway station number six along line two on this walk. There's also another entrance to it just to the east of here on Bedford, which is also where Mayor John Tory lives. You can take St. George South, kind of through the heart of the University of Toronto St. George campus. And it'll run north up to DuPont Street. You can 
wave to the surveillance cameras at the Chinese consulate on the way. There's Varsity Stadium, which was once home to a much bigger stadium. We've got a dome surface over the playing field. There is an arena just behind it. And the CN Tower is directly south of us here. That's kind of neat. I do remember once seeing a Beck concert at Varsity Arena. And the opening acts for that were actually a band no one had heard of at the time called The Roots, along with another band called Atari Teenage Riot. This Tim Hortons would often be full of students from other countries studying English. Toronto is probably one of the most prominent Western destinations for students looking to travel abroad and study English. There's where the mayor lives. It's not too uncommon to see people protesting in this area. Cars like that really shouldn't be starting their turn until it's clear. If they get rear-ended, they'll get pushed right into a pedestrian crossing. And really, by doing that, they're saving themselves all of, what, one fiftieth of a second? And they finally do make their turn? There's the University of Toronto's Royal Conservatory. A lot of nice Christmas lights on the trees out in front. And that's the Royal Ontario Museum. And I think it's been closed since November. So who knows when that will actually reopen. There'll be a 42-story condo going in that location. And a long time ago, where this McDonald's is, it used to be a fairly huge and iconic location. But that building was demolished and they put in a new McDonald's into the base of the new unit. And I think I heard that they had a very long and favorable lease at their prior location. And that was negotiated into the new space. 
Although if you're a landlord, that's probably as good a tenant as you can get. A company like that with a prime location. And this is Avenue Road on the left. And on the south is Queens Park. And that'll turn into University Avenue once you get south of Queens Park Crescent. That's a rather large, swanky location of Club Monaco. Welcome to Yorkville. This particular stretch is known as the Mink Mile. I think this is the highest cost per square foot retail in the entire country. Certainly a lot of high-end retailers on this stretch. And Yorkville Village is just a block to the north of here, along Cumberland and Yorkville Avenue and the streets that connect them. There you'll find more high-end high boutiques and retailers and restaurants. And this sidewalk is just smothered in salt. You can't really see it probably on the camera, but you can certainly hear it on that guy's shoes. And we have snow flurries. I almost want to get away from this guy. His <laughs> shoes are so distracting. The microphone I use is rather sensitive and tends to pick up every little squeak and sound like that. So coming up here is Bay Street at the next major intersection. Once we go past this former Pottery Barn location. I'm not sure what kind of retailer will move into a building so obviously designed for Pottery Barn. Although this is Yorkville, I wouldn't be surprised if someone's willing to spend a small fortune to redo that exterior. And just up ahead, after Belair Street, will be Bay Street. And just to the north here on Belair, as well as Bay, you'll find Bay Station, which will be subway station number seven along this route. Hopefully I haven't miscounted, and I'm just making a fool of myself every time I bring that up. If you were to go north there and explore Yorkville, you'll certainly Walk past a lot of really high-end vehicles. And this intersection here at Bay and Bloor used to be a scramble crossing, so it would stop traffic in all directions and allow pedestrians to cross however they pleased. The city had trialed another scramble just to the east of here at Bay and Bloor, and they deemed that this one wasn't utilized enough, so it reverted back to a normal 
functioning intersection, but they kept the scramble at Bamboo. And the only other scramble I can think of is at Young and Dundas. So that would be the city's two most prominent intersections, I would imagine. That do have scramble crossings. I guess the volume of people at this one wasn't quite high enough to justify it. I'm not sure how much snow we're supposed to get, but it seems to be rather light and quite wet. I came down this part of Blur Street last night on a live stream, and they were pouring concrete into One Blur West, which is rising right there. So they had the whole street blocked off for that. There's a look at whole red fruit, red fruit. I almost said whole red fruit. That's a high-end Canadian department store. I think those are valet parkers doing their business. Man, you can still hear that guy's shoes. I let him get way up ahead. So it's going to be really fun watching this tower go up. We have one bluer west here, and at the south end of Young Street, there's another monster, super tall tower going up. This one was designed by Norman Foster, so those two will be the two tallest towers in the city when all is said and done. Well, outside of the CN Tower, of course. And here is Young and Bluer. It looks like the scramble crossing is engaged. There's some people that have no clue how to drive. It's pretty obvious you shouldn't enter an intersection if you can't fully clear it. That guy has two cars back. And we've got some full-on snowfall now, folks just as I'm arriving at Luryong Station, which is a good thing. I don't have an umbrella or any way to cover up my non-waterproof camera. That guy just blatantly ran a red light. Speaking of bad drivers. And I will head down into the line to Entrance. Normally I head north, but I'll be hopping on a train and going east. So I've got my mask on. This is north on Yonk Street here. And that wasn't so bad, my camera didn't get too wet. You can head straight down this platform and connect to 
Line 1, which is north and southbound. And here's the train. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this stroll down Bloor Street West, starting from Dufferin Station. Line 2, Clark County. And taking us all the way to Bloor Young Station. Let's grab a look at the station as we roll out. Next station, Sherburne. Sherburne Station. There are links to my Patreon account if you wish to support the channel. You can also check out channel memberships on the main YouTube page. And I do have an Instagram account. Also, don't forget to check out the Johnny Stumbles channel. There's a link to that. You can check that out and subscribe if you wish. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. I will catch you on the next one.